prevented innovation. I am pleased that the OECD invited Austria to co-host this workshop together with the European Commission and to contribute to practical examples as a lead case. My name is Michael Kallinger. I work as head of unit for public sector innovation in the Austrian Federal Ministry of Civil Service. The broader subject of this workshop is public sector innovation. It is the further development of public services with the aim of increasing public value. Enhancement oriented innovation deals with the gradual or incremental improvements as opposed to disruptive leaps. The two Austrian cases presented today are examples of developments that can also be viewed over the long term with all their steps, even the very long term. The Austrian tax administration has been developed again and again since Maria Theresa, at least for 250 years, but we will not go into detail in this regard. We will examine the steps taken by Finance Online in recent years. The development of the administration of the city of Vienna can also be traced back very far in history for over 2000 years. Quality of life, affordable quality of life in a big city, that is always an issue. In this workshop, you will also have the opportunity to take a more in-depth look at some other examples that focus on the relationships between customers and stakeholders and how to optimize them. For example, how to ensure communication in many languages in the example of Portugal. Opportunities for influencing stakeholders in the Australian case. And another example of the use of digital tools for communication. The practical examples are introduced by three scientific presentations on the relationship between administrative paradigms and innovation and behavioral insight. So we have examples ranging from Austria to Australia, to antipodal countries, and we have participants from all over the world. And we have very different topics to deal with. Uh, although we are of course pleased that the OECD invited Austria as a lead case for enhancement oriented innovation, I would like to conclude by saying that like most countries, we also use other types of innovation. On the subject of anticipatory, anticipatory innovation, for example, a project on the future of work is currently running. And we have another one called Austria 2035, me and the state. So uh, thanks to all presentators for the preparation. And I look forward to exchanging ideas with you, with the participants. Uh, Pirat, I hand over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. My name is Pirat Tenorist and I work at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, uh, where we're actually working on all different types of innovation. And it is great to have such lead countries such as Austria who are kind of putting the spotlight on different types of innovation and how to actually do them well. So in this workshop, we're going to talk about enhancement oriented innovation, which is actually one of the most uh, uh, spread and common innovation types in the public sector in its entirety. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're going to do today, uh, what we're going to see as was so greatly also outlined by Michael, um, but also about the specific cases of enhancement oriented innovation and why it is so important for the public sector in its entirety. So moving uh, forward uh, as well, uh, what are we going to uh, see today and who are going to guide us through this journey? So the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation is currently working on quite an extensive piece of research across different types of innovation. And on enhancement oriented innovation, we have uh, the team of Angela Hansen, who is our lead on innovation tools and methods. Uh, Sam Nutt, uh, who is working on innovation, global trends and cross-border collaborations. Uh, Chiara uh, Blackenwagner, who is uh, running our soon to be launched uh, mission innovation lab. And uh, Davide Abijani, who is our, also on our research on our cross-border collaborations and innovations. And all of them will be joining you in the breakout rooms uh, together with other OECD colleagues to also guide through the conversation. And they're doing great work in terms of the research into what enhancement oriented innovation is and what it actually entails. And today we're going to have a bit of a, 
and discuss the discussion about, about the kind of the core principles of what enhancement oriented innovation uh, are, but we're going to look at also the specific or different types of innovation in its entirety. So we're going to uh, really link also some of the discussion around a uh, level of discussion that has been around in the public sector for quite some time. And it's the topic of public sector productivity. So how to actually increase uh, productivity in the public sector, where public sectors, as normally known, are usually in the business of uh, diminishing returns. So how to actually what kind of drivers uh, are there connected to that? And we have Professor Patrick Van Levy from LSC to tell us more about this work and also what we have, what we know so far uh, about productivity in the public sector. And we have a great colleague from uh, the OECD, Chiara Varazzi, who is leading our behavioral insights work, uh, who is going to tell us about how behavioral insights and can be applied for efficiency and enhancement oriented innovation gains within the public sector. So we see great opportunities within the field. And uh, Dr. Tobias Stolzer uh, from the University of Vienna is also going to tell us a little bit about how uh, you know, public administration paradigms have been actually influencing uh, different types of innovation and especially also spurring on enhancement oriented innovation in its entirety. And during the rest of the session, we're going to hear from uh, different cases from around the world, uh, uh, both in breakout rooms and also in the plenary about quality management from the city of Vienna, from digitalization, from the Australian uh, Austrian tax office and the OECD's uh, telemedicine case. We're also going to hear about streamlining uh, different services from Portugal and also applying behavioral insights in practice towards efficiency and effectiveness gains. And we also have uh, good questions around the tools and methods and drivers of these uh, initiatives and how they could be actually applied in practice for you as well. Uh, later on, we're going to also ask you to uh, show your interest in the different uh, breakout rooms. And we're going to also give you detailed descriptions uh, about how to show that interest so you end up in the right breakout room that you want to participate in. But first and foremost, uh, what is the, all this work about? So the Observatory Public Sector Innovation at the OECD has developed the innovation facets model. And we look at different types of innovation uh, from mission-oriented innovation to adaptive innovation to anticipatory innovation and enhancement-oriented innovation. And all of these innovations have a strategic role to play within the public sector. So we want to reach our goals and high-level challenges through missions. We want to adapt to emerging changes uh, from the ground on adaption, we want to also anticipate future risks uh, and uncertainties. But most of all as well, and most commonly, we want to also provide value for money and do the work that we're doing efficiently and, and effectively in practice. So in reality, all innovations that have been actually successful, all developments of public services in the public sector, in terms of innovation portfolios, end up at some point in enhancement oriented innovation activity. So actually trying to make your current processes, your current systems that are really the weight of the public sector in its entirety, as efficient, as effective as possible. And this also shows within our observatory public sector innovation database, where we see that enhancement oriented innovations are by far the most common type of innovations and sometimes quite impressive in terms of the results uh, that are undertaken around governments around the world. And we're really looking at uh, how enhancement-oriented innovation also fits in to the broader uh, portfolio for public sector innovation. So we have run already um, workshops on mission-oriented innovation, being simulated uh, missions uh, together with our partners around the world. Uh, we have also discussed anticipatory innovation governance and now we are really looking at the kind of the ins and outs of enhancement or innovation. If you're also interested in upcoming work, then on June 8th, we're going to run a similar workshop on adaptive innovation with great speakers around the world, uh, which is co-hosted together with uh, Portugal. So if you're interested in that, please drop a note uh, in the chat or uh, please uh, let us know over an email that you would want to join and you will uh, get the links from us as well. So invites to that are going out as we speak. 
But as again, what is enhancement oriented innovation? So what are we actually uh, talking about? So in the broader portfolio of innovations, we are really talking about in the area of certainty of upgrading practices, achieving efficiencies and better results and building on the existing structures uh, rather than really fundamentally or radically challenging the status quo. And this is not to say that some of these uh, kind of enhancement oriented innovations do not become quite radically shifting in terms of public services. So we have seen many digitally oriented projects, the digitalization projects within the public sector that starts with small upgrades in terms of digital identity or otherwise that actually have very fundamental effects within the public sector in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, but also new types of services and innovations that this type of uh, um, innovation actually allows to bring forward. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally as well, uh, we are also seeing that enhancement oriented innovation creates room for other types of innovations to happen. So one of the most uh, uh, frequently cited challenges within the public sector is really the challenge of time. So what do we invest our time in? So enhancement oriented innovation in many cases actually allows to save time for public sector uh, uh, officials to invest time in innovations uh, also beyond uh, what the currently governments are doing. So without enhancement oriented innovation, new things and new public services and uh, processes cannot really emerge. And uh, we have also conducted a semi uh, quasi systematic review in terms of what do we know about the enhancement oriented innovation as such. So mostly in terms of practice, we see process oriented innovations, service innovations, um, but also some structural innovations that are coming out of these processes. But there are uh, many cases where actually enhancement oriented innovation could be taken further. So you see as well that sometimes even enhancement oriented innovation that enjoys uh, from cost reductions, austerity, and these kind of natural drivers within the public sector actually needs more push to kind of deliver the last mile innovations of really making uh, services at scale more efficient and cheaper, but also adopting innovations uh, to pushing them forward. And one of the examples that is going to be discussed today is of course telemedicine which we already had in terms of solutions for over 20 years in some cases. And we see a rapid adoption only 20 years later, while the efficiency and effectiveness gains were known for quite a long time. So a lot of topics around also on lean management, one-shot stops, sharing services, nudging, and also in many cases also still motivated by digital transformation. So most digital transformation cases that at least observatory analyzers are actually in the basis of enhancement oriented innovation. So we haven't seen kind of true artificial intelligence or truly reimagining of civil services, public services in the public sector yet. So there's still ways to go connected to that. And um, there is a kind of return on investment that is clear uh, connected to enhancement oriented innovation. So uh, usually this is also a type of innovation that is most loved by ministries of finance because it can really you know you can make a case in terms of efficiency and effectiveness at least to some degree and it can also pave the way or the journey towards riskier innovations and act as a gateway for transformations that i talked about before so the announcement of innovations they are not only internal gains that we want to achieve so it's not only about productivity of a service or otherwise but we can also save time for citizens and also have these kind of public value gains elsewhere. So we have to consider it a little bit more uh, widely in terms of the return on investment when we're talking about enhancement. Of course, productivity has a big role to pay. And some of the examples that we've selected out from our uh, additional examples from our own database um, uh, to show is as well is that kind of these digital platforms that have emerged, for example, in Singapore have really increased or made the baseline for systems interoperability and totally new types of services that can build upon a system that actually communicates better than before. We can also see uh, proactive family benefits and new life event-based services being uh, produced in this frame. 
So we're actually enhancing the systems of IT systems and building up uh, new types of services that make life easier for citizens based on those developments. We can also see uh, this kind of procurement pre-certification for different types of enhancements to actually make it uh, possible to fast track, uh, fast track very old processes like public sector procurement uh, in the context of the public sector in its entirety. So as you can see, it can really kind of cement very fundamental shifts within the public sector when applied in the right way. And not to further ado, and not to keep speaking about these prospects, I am going to give the floor over to um, Professor Patrick and Levis, whose work I've been admiring for many, many years, who has done great work on public sector productivity and uh, has great insights also for the enhancement of innovation. So I'm going to give the floor over to you. Uh, Patrick, uh, will you tell us a little bit about your work? Thanks very much. Um, I've got some slides, but uh, I don't know if we can uh, share screen to see those. Um, um, yes, you have the opportunity to share slides or we can pull it up for you. If you, if you, if, if you could pull it up, that would probably be better. Okay, so uh, it will be there okay. in, in a minute. Or so. Sorry, I, I, I sent the slides in. What I'm talking about here is uh, public sector productivity. And public sector productivity is a very uh, rather neglected uh, aspect of government operations. Um, it really focuses uh, very well in terms of enhancement oriented innovation. It focuses really on the substantive nature of the services that you're uh, delivering. And what it seeks to do really is to look in a long term way over five to 10 years at how you're uh, promoting and achieving improvements in your um, in your uh, uh, services in your core services. So what public sector productivity focuses on is just total outputs divided by total inputs. So it's a ratio of how much uh, output you're getting for particular inputs. Um, yeah. If we could go to slideshow and that's, that's great. Um, so if we could move to the next slide. So that's really all uh, productivity entails that you focus on. It's looking at a, a total outputs produced by an organization divided by the total value of the inputs used in producing them. Um, now those are difficult concepts to operationalize in the public sector, but um, uh, I'll show in a minute how, how you do them. And then what we can look at uh, in the diagram is that productivity can vary on different, um, different rays. So the different rays going through the origin of the uh, organizations that you see there show uh, organizations with differing levels of productivity. And what we're trying to get to is a, a steeper angle of, of productivity. And you can see also that if you look at cases of productivity over time, you can define a production frontier and see how organizations that are inside the frontier can move to, towards it. And what you're going to be doing in, in, in uh, looking at that, we can see in the next slide. Um, next slide, yes. So, Really, there's three key drivers of uh, productivity change in the public sector, which have been neglected by economists, but are now beginning to be studied, partly because we're in an era of very rapid productivity change in some public services. So the three key areas are specialization, increasing professionalization and specialization of uh, roles, increasing capital intensity, which is growing quite rapidly now, in the public sector with uh, digitalization. For example, there's a current wave of robotic process automation that is sweeping through a lot of uh, national governments and will work down into state and local governments uh, as well. Uh, we can see increased capital intensity in things like immigration agencies, which used to be big paper-based agencies and have radically transformed over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the third big 
motor of public sector productivity is embodied technological change. So uh, we have a lot of external technology changes that are influencing all these three things. Uh, they're influencing specialization, they're influencing capital intensity. Uh, we're moving towards uh, moving away from the public sector being seen as a low capital intensity area and moving towards it being seen as a, a high capital intensity area. And of course, digitalization means we've had a lot of embodied technological change. These three forces push through into creating in most public sector organizations, a very considerable internal potential for productivity gain and innovation over time. But whether the productivity gain is realized, the box right on the extreme right of your thing depends on the ability of the society and the clients and the customers that the agency is dealing with to take up the uh, uh, productivity gain. So for example, um, it was uh, much easier to get uh, taxpayers to move their uh, activities, uh, interactions with the state online than it was to move welfare clients uh, online. So it took 10 to 15 years, uh, more years to move welfare clients online than it did uh, taxpayers for reasons to do with society and digital inequalities. Once the productivity gain is realized, you create big um, feedback effects that uh, boost the take up of, of the uh, innovative uh, solutions, uh, especially as people learn how they work and get to understand them. And of course, we have big feedback effects at the bottom of the graph here of the diagram here towards the back office operations of the organization. For example, at the moment, big data and artificial intelligence are reshaping uh, a lot of um, public sector agencies activities. So if we move to the next slide, why has public sector productivity not been so important in the past? Why, for example, have national statistics for more than 80 years tended to put into the national accounts estimates of public sector productivity, which are based on total inputs divided by total inputs, which means that public sector productivity has historically been seen as stable. Well, the key problem has been the difficulty of measuring, identifying and counting what are the really core outputs and activities of uh, an agency. Sometimes we can measure outputs. Sometimes as with defense, we can't really measure outputs, but we can measure activities. So what are the steps needed to measure um, uh, public sector productivity? Firstly, just to focus on what are the really core mission outputs of your agency. Secondly, develop unit costs or activity accounting for core outputs. And from that, you can define a cost weighted total output metric. What that means is that just as a firm produces widget A and widget B and they have different costs, in order to calculate total output for the firm, we need to me measure price times cost. Uh, price times output for each uh, widget and then add them together. Or we need to do the same thing for uh, public sector agencies. So a cost weighted total output metric. And you can use average costs ideally for outputs. If you haven't got that, um, the solution from At the Atkinson report in 2005, which has worked very well, which we use uh, in a lot of our work is to substitute administrative costs in order to weight outputs. That gives you a total output uh, cost, a cost-weighted total output. Most public agencies already have good total inputs cost numbers. Uh, I would just mention that uh, you need to include privatized uh, outsourced services here. We can't do labor productivity assessment in the modern public sector. So then all we need to do is divide total outputs by total inputs, which gives us a measure of total factor productivity. Um, and we can make that an index number, pick one year as 100, and then look at what happens to that index number over time. In more personal and particularly decentralized state and local government services, regional and local government services, you will need to have a strategy for handling quality issues. Um, 
in the central government, normally you can assume a pretty standard level of uh, quality, but in services like health, education, policing, we need to sometimes, or usually reweight total cost weighted total outputs by quality variations as well to avoid various um, paradoxes and so forth. Well, now, how important is all this um, for uh, public sector agencies? It's been neglected before, um, so why can't we carry on neglecting it? Well, let me just give you some examples from a study that we undertook in uh, the UK. If we go to the next slide. This shows the um, productivity in UK taxation over a period of 10 years, during which the um, tax agency uh, invested a lot of money in moving its most expensive and costly forms of taxation, which is the self-assessed income tax online, and also most company taxes moved online. So the pink uh, line here shows you the volume of labor and intermediate inputs involved in the tax agency's operation. The um, blue line shows you the tax output, uh, and you can see that over the period as a whole, there was a great uh, increase in tax output because this is a very productive period of British uh, economic activity. And the green line shows you what happened to tax agency productivity. So it took some time to get started, but basically from 2004-05, it really began to grow. And across the uh, uh, period as a whole, there was a more than 40% increase in tax uh, productivity. Now let's just move to the next slide which shows social security productivity over a longer period, actually, no, from, from the same period. Um, and you can see that the uh, pink uh, side show, uh, line shows the inputs, the blue line again shows the outputs, uh, and the uh, green line shows the productivity. And what happened here was there was a big reorganization done by the um, social security agency. In the 2000s, they spent a lot of money on moving over to a telephone-based system. Um, and that system didn't really work. And uh, at the end of this period, only uh, a half of 1% of um, uh, Social Security claims was being made uh, online. Um, so you can see that what happened was that the um, productivity line, the green line, first of all, fell very sharply, so 20, 20%, 20 uh, and then took a long time to recover. And at the end of 10 years, the agency was basically in a standstill position. At that time, 80% of tax uh, claims were being made online, and as I say, half of 1% of Social Security claims. Now, subsequently, this uh, ministry has invested very heavily in digitalization and Actually, that new system has been quite troubled and took 10 years to implement, but has just worked very, very well during the, the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK, which has very severely affected unemployment. And so the, the Social Security Agency, after this 10-year hiatus where they didn't do enhancement orientated innovation properly or made the wrong strategic decisions, have now moved towards uh, uh, moving towards a fully digital model. And that's paid off in the COVID period. Let me just give you two, you might be thinking, well, these are very big giant agencies and they've got a huge capability to assess their own operations and to improve them over time. Well, that doesn't all automatically happen as the, the graph we're looking at now shows. But we can also look at smaller agencies. If we look at the next slide, this one shows productivity in UK passport issuing. Uh, there was an increased uh, volume of uh, traffic for um, uh, the UK passport agency because more and more British people went overseas on holiday during the early 2000s. So you can see the blue line uh, goes up, but also you can see that the uh, pink line for total inputs goes up. And over the period as a whole, um, the green line showing total productivity 
just about stays the same um, with periodic reductions below. Um, this actually performance is better than you might think because the, the agency was creating the basis for digital passports and that required some more administrative staff to uh, uh, you know, establish people's initial identities. So there are reasons why this happened, but basically it's a pretty static productivity picture in passports. But that at least is better than the last example that we want to look at on the next slide, which shows UK driver vehicle licensing. And here you can see that the numbers of drivers basically stayed the same over the decade. Input costs steadily rose because of a digitalization scheme that was imperfect and, and took a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, labor to correct and productivity slumped by 35% over the decade. So the important thing really is for every agency in the public sector, whatever level they're at, whatever they're doing, to really think about um, uh, productivity in a long run way. Um, moving on to my last slide, let me just stress that the productivity focus is different from an efficiency focus in many key ways. First of all, the productivity focus happens every year. You should definitely be looking at annual productivity or even quarterly productivity if, if the data allows you to do that. Um, but you need to have a run of data going over five years or 15 quarters in order to show a consistent trend. And that means you also need to keep your data measurement stable over the long term. A lot of public sector agencies change and chop and change their output indices uh, a great deal. And th that's very bad for measuring your productivity and uh, really retaining a clear focus on whether you're doing better with an upward slope or whether you're stable or whether you've actually got a productivity decline going on. So productivity is something that needs to be addressed constantly every year. It's not the same as an efficiency focus, which is usually efficiency reviews are big ad hoc things. They um, are achieved you know, periodically. And, and then there's also a very small efficiency gain from internal audit, but that's very, very incremental. Productivity is different because it focuses on the substantive services, the big issues like digitalization, the adoption of big data, artificial intelligence is the next big automation thing. Uh, the concept of productivity is that the production frontier for public sector agencies is constantly expandable. It's not fixed uh, as an efficiency focus tends to, uh, tends to say. And how do you improve productivity? Well, you do it by new services, new customers, increasing capital intensity, implementing innovations, and on the whole, keeping staff numbers pretty stable. And finally, what are the key mantras of the two things? Well, for productivity, the mantra is, let's achieve better quality for customers and citizens, simpler processes for staff, cheaper production for the agency. You need to do all those three things simultaneously. Uh, whereas efficiency is, is just about lowering costs and often entails actually cutting services, which is not what uh, public service productivity is about at all. And I think in the rest of this session, you're going to run through some really great examples of people looking very hard at substantive services and working through uh, changes. Maybe they're incremental, maybe they're not incremental. I, uh, I think productivity gains can be very non-incremental over time too. And thanks very much for uh, listening. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, uh, for everybody joining us uh, and listening in. Please uh, add your questions to Patrick in the chat. And I think from the last uh, slide onward, you could also see why we like the concept of productivity connected to enhancement oriented innovation, especially because its connection to the keeping the quality of the services uh, or, the, or increasing the volume of the services, but really having the value also uh, for the citizens in place. So not only having an efficiency focus where we can cut the cross or cut services or cut our activities, 
but really driving by the productivity measures themselves. So I think that more systematic measurement of productivity across the public sector organizations and agencies would be an absolutely fantastic way to also drive uh, enhancement-oriented innovations in public sector organizations. And I'm now going to switch off to Chiara Verazzi, uh, who is going to tell us about the behavioral insights and how they could be applied to increase uh, uh, also and produce uh, enhancement-oriented innovations. Uh, Chiara, over to you. And don't forget to put your questions in the chat. We're going to collect them. And after all our speakers have had a chance, then we're going to come back to them. Thanks so much, Pirat, um, for this introduction. And thanks for Patrick for a great presentation. So my name is Chiara. And for the next 10 minutes, I will talk to you about how behavioral insights, so one of the, the many tools we are using at OPSI, um, can improve public sector effectiveness. Um, so first of all, why behavioral science? I'm, I'm conscious that maybe not all of you are familiar with this. Um, so why behavioral science is basically, basically because most public policies really involves human behavior. So I'm sure that this is pretty salient in the last 12 months with this pandemic, all this preventative behavior from washing, washing your hands to getting vaccinated are actually behaviors. Um, but as well in other more normal times, uh, behaviors are something that it's really important, starting from um, you know, behaviors linked to um, environmentally friendly um, attitudes as well. And the thing is that we know from behavioral science that we are systematically biased and we are quite um, you know, irrational when uh, making decisions. And the fact is that in public sector, uh, most policymakers often assume an unrealistic model of human behavior. So really the, the work of myself and other people around the world um, is to try and embed this evidence from behavioral science to improve public policy. And so in practice, if you think about the very simplistic way of uh, depicting public policy, governments traditionally rely on three main policy tools um, to change uh, the behaviors of citizens. One is giving information. So if you think, if you think about getting vaccinated for COVID, um, government can tell you that it's very important to do so. Um, government can also regulate things. Uh, so this is a big lever. So for example, I can tell you that it's, uh, you, you can't get on a flight if you're not uh, vaccinated. And finally, uh, government has the lever of incentives. So both financial incentives and non-financial incentives, thinking about taxes or tax breaks as well. But often all these tools are not enough to change people's behaviors. And so behavioral insights is something that can really help to improve the effectiveness of information, regulation, incentives as traditional public policy tools. So for the sake of time, I will present to you two quick st case studies, just to give an idea of how to um, adapt this in practice to public policy. Then I will talk to you about return investment in the case of behavioral science. And finally, some limitations um, of this approach, especially in scaling what works. So the first case study I wanted to share with you is I think one of the most famous um, proof of concepts of the the effectiveness of behavioral science in public policy. Um, and so the question here was, um, you know, how uh, did the behavioral insights team in the UK help um, the tax um, agency in the UK to collect an extra 200 million pounds in tax debt in just a year? So we're talking about uh, a lot of money here. And the only thing they did really was to improve the existing letter that uh, government was sending to citizens. And they added one single sentence. They added the sentence that said, uh, nine out of 10 people pay, pay their tax on time. So this is, it seems very simple, uh, and it is in fact, um, but it's really leveraging something that is called social proof. And it works really well in motivating people. So these were the results. And as you can see, uh, compared to the control group, um, so that you can see in black, um, all the letters that they sent, especially when they, they, they said how many people um, actually pay taxes in their neighborhood, really work well. And as you can see, the percentage of taxpayers that pay tax in time um, increased significantly. 
And sometimes we we often we are often asked if this is very context specific. And funnily enough, you know, Patrick uh, also talked a, a, a lot about the UK. So I just wanted to present to you uh, a similar, similar results from the same team, but in Guatemala this time, so completely different cultural settings. So they did something very similar and they calculated the percentage of taxpayers that pay tax um, accordingly to the letter they received. And uh, in this uh, randomized control trial, uh, the difference between the worst and the best performing letters when rolled out nationally in Guatemala was over 300,000 um, American dollars of savings. So again, in terms of the effectiveness with only one single letter, we changing one single sentence can have a big impact. Another case study that I wanted to, sh to share with you is um, a project I, I, I led in Australia about saving, uh, where we were trying to save hospitals money. And here again, I'm choosing this because it's a simple one. Um, so we wanted to reduce the number of patients who miss their specialist appointments uh, at hospitals. Uh, and this was a big issue. Um, I, I'm sure that maybe it's the case in many different countries, but um, given that it's, it's free, you don't pay anything, many people don't show up uh, to the specialist appointment. So what we, do, we did is that we uh, sent um, a letter, a very simple letter uh, ahead of their appointments to patients. And we did another simple thing. So we included a map to support patients to find their way to the clinic. This was a very, very big um, hospital. So many people were actually, you know, it, it added a lot of frictions not to know where to go. And the other group of patients just didn't receive any reminder. So business as usual. The results were uh, really good. So patients who received the reminder letter were 32% less likely to miss their hospital appointment, as you can see here. And in terms of savings, if this uh, is scaled, this reduction in missed appointments represents um, 1.68 million uh, per year and more than 9,000 preventable non-attendance per year. And in terms of return on investment, it's a nine to one return on investment. So again, a very simple intervention, uh, but with big returns. Um, so let's talk about now uh, about return on investment a, a little bit more systematically as linked with financial impact. Um, so I, I've told you that there are return investment on this, but you know, like I think that the most important thing is that behavioral science, at least as it has applied until now in public policy, really allowed you to um, compute the ratio of the impact to cost as compared to a counterfactual. So this is the most important thing is because all these um, trials were done using randomized controlled trials. So you have the new innovative intervention and then the business as usual, that it's your counterfactual. And a simple way to, to calculate this is that, you know, a re return investment is simply the impact uh, to cost. And so for every single trial you can, um, you can divide the effect size by the cost of the trial. And so I don't want you to read all these, but just to give an idea that there is a meta analysis of all these, um, really trying to, uh, to understand if behavioral science is something that it's, it's worth it at the, at the bigger picture level. And so these I'm, I'm showing to you here um, an example of a comparison between um, um, a policy intervention in to try and have more people vaccinated. So in one case, um, you, they were using an educational campaign, just saying people um, that vaccinating, being vaccinated is important. And another one using a prompt um, to, uh, to employees. And the beauty of this, uh, this approach is that you can calculate the return investment in terms of real impact. So you can see in red here, um, there were one, more or less one additional people vaccinated per $100 spent, while with the other intervention, there were more than 12 additional people vaccinated per $100 spent. So this is the kind of approach that we use in behavioral science, and we really always try to um, compare our innovative interventions to the business as usual or the counterfactual. Now, uh, this seems all great, uh, but some limitations, there are many limitations about this. One that I would like to share with you is the fact that um, most of the time, the experiments are not scaled up. So 
So we do these great experiments with amazing effort sizes, but then, you know, in many cases, they're not scale up, they're not implemented. What do we mean by scaling up? It means implementation, implement, implementing an experiment. So imagine that, you know, the experiment about attending hospital appointment, uh, we did this like on 30,000 people. It means trying to do it um, at a larger, uh, in a larger population. Um, and one thing that we did when I was still working in Australia is that we try uh, to understand what are the factors and activities they influence whether these kind of experiments are scaled or not. And so we reviewed all published evidence and as well, we interviewed more than 20 practitioners to do so. And we discovered many different things because, you know, like if, if you're doing an experiment, but, it, but then it's not scale up, it has been quite um, useless. And so we, we, we try to understand what are the, some of the reasons for this. Uh, one might be external val validity, as I explained to you a bit of, at the very beginning. So maybe, you know, your experiment worked really well in one setting, but maybe it doesn't work in a bigger setting. It, it can be the case that you have diminishing returns. So maybe uh, the experiment efficiency reduces over time or more resources are needed uh, to run um, exactly the same thing. One thing that I found myself to be very important is the commitment to scale. So, um, you know, stakeholders may take a wait and see approach uh, to experiments that can lead to an insufficient investment in, in scaling up the successful innovation. And finally, something to, to share as well is some backfiring effect. Uh, so what can encourage positive behavior in one specific setting um, can actually reduce positive behavior in another setting. So this is just an example of some examples of the barriers in terms of trying to uh, rip, to, to, to transform um, results in meaningful impact and scale this up. Uh, so I hope it was I was in time and that I show you two case studies and some. Um, insights about return investments and scaling what works. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing the other presenters as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiara. Um, such great insights as well. We have seen behavioral insights being starting to be used in the public sector, uh, but I said as well, there is a huge uh, opportunity to actually use behavioral insights in a broader sense as well and especially looking at kind of how to enhance your services and uh, how to to um, your citizens and your people that the public sector is actually serving so there are great opportunities for also uh, cost savings but also productivity increases in the public sector through the use of behavioral insights and really understanding uh, who the people you are you're working with uh, inside and outside of the public sector in its entirety. But now we're going to go to Tobias uh, Bolzer, who is um, working at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. And we're going to dive into a very interesting topic as well, connected to enhancement-oriented innovation, which is uh, how public administration paradigms, so the stories we tell about what public sector, you know, public sector should concentrate on, uh, what are our kind of core principles, how they affect actually the type of innovation that we are doing and how they have actually influenced, uh, hopefully also partially, uh, different types of innovation, but also enhancement oriented innovation within the public sector. Uh, Tobias, I will give it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Piret. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tobias Poitzer. I'm a uh, assistant professor at VU Vienna University of Economics and Business. And my research interests are all kinds of um, reforms and changes in um, the public sector. What I would like to do is, and I think it fits quite well, um, because Patrick and Chiara put a strong focus on examples from um, organizations. So what types of enhancement oriented innovations have been implemented in organizations? And what I want to do is go a bit beyond or take one step back and have a look at um, the context, so to say, in which enhancement oriented innovation takes place.
So don't uh, don't be shocked. Um, uh, academics like uh, tables and, 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 and summaries. So what I showed you here is um, different so-called administrative paradigms and administrative paradigms that uh, kind of set the scene, set the context in which um, innovation takes place. So what are these uh, paradigms? Well, these paradigms are basically um, core ideas, yeah, are the broad concepts against the backdrop of which um, administrations work. And then in turn, how innovation in the public sector works. So paradigms are, so to say, the broad models uh, against which innovation takes place. They define what are central ideas in an administration. What are problems to be addressed? Yeah? And then also, in turn, what are instruments? Um, what are the solutions? And they provide, so to say, a pattern um, for action. Also for civil servants, um, for managers who then steer um, innovation. What we observed over the past year, um, decades, so to say, is that we had a shift from, you see it here on the left side, classical public administration, traditional public administration, then to new public management, end of the 1970s, 1980s for sure, um, yeah, continental European countries a bit later, um, towards a new paradigm that is um, referred to as the new um, public governance. So um, each of these paradigms, as I said, has um, a focus on different problems and what would be the solutions um, for them. So the goal um, for new public management, I'm focusing um, rather on NPM and uh, new public governance, is like increasing efficiency, um, cutting slack, whereas uh, for new public governance, it is more on quality improvement, but also then um, collaboration with actors from civil society uh, and uh, enhancing innovation. These um, yeah, yeah, paradigms differ in terms of the solutions that they are offering. Yeah? So in new public management, we are focusing on public-private competition, on deregulations, on performance measurement and management. Whereas in new public governance, it is more about yeah, public-private, civil society um, collaborations through networks, partnerships. Yeah? So that's the, um, the, the, the setting. So, how does this relate to um, enhancement-oriented innovation? Well, um, I tried to put some of the key words um, that um, came up during the first presentations and then also um, at, the, at the observatory. Yeah, um, what type of innovations are we talking about when we refer to um, different paradigms? So for new public management, it is clearly on uh, cost effective uh, efficiency, value for money, um, performance improvement, but also focusing on clients um, um, for, for the enhancement um, of, of productivity. In a, a new public governance era, yeah, um, we are focusing more on co-creation of um, solutions uh, with, with communities. So getting access to um, yeah, resources in society, developing solutions um, together yeah, and collaborations between um, actors. I don't want to talk too much now um, about uh, the roles of public sector employees, um, the roles of managers and roles of, of, of politicians. Yeah, It's just like um, for a new public management, it's more like a strategic focus on inputs and outputs. So um, this kind of fits nicely to what uh, Patrick Dan Levy said. And in new public governance, it's more like um, the idea that we have leaders yeah, that um, kind of um, yeah, uh, facilitate collaborations um, also with uh, citizens. Okay. Very briefly, so um, the question when we talk about enhancement oriented uh, innovations, we are talking about small steps. Yeah? And here, um, research has found that also small steps can eventually lead to institutional change. So here, um, a, a table um, 
from, from two researchers that look at processes of change. Is it an incremental change, yeah? Or is it more an abrupt and more radical um, change? And in the public sector, yeah, most innovations, and uh, Piret said this uh, in the opening presentations, uh, uh, take place at a small step-by-step -step, um, approach. But also then, if we look at the outcome or the result of change, um, we can also see that through incremental steps, um, we can have a gradual transformation and um, having um, kind of an, an improvement um, over time. When we talk about um, innovation in, um, yeah, in, 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 in a new public governance um, paradigm or era, um, here's an example from um, my own research. So what we find or what we found uh, here is uh, that there are basically three factors that are important. So we were looking at a, um, at a, at a uh, at a hospital in Portugal, and uh, the overall aim was to prevent falls in this hospital. And um, there was a project group set up, and uh, they developed uh, yeah, all kinds of solutions from um, covering the floors, uh, changing the towels in the bathrooms from textile to, um, to paper towels, and then um, yeah, uh, implementing a false prevention scale. And what we found, what are the driving factors that really spurred innovation um, in a new public governance uh, paradigm is that we had the trust um, of employees at an individual level. Yeah? We had this uh, false prevention group at a um, yeah, team level. Yeah? But then this collaboration between organizational units um, at um, the hospital level. Yeah? And um, we kind of found that the interplay of these three factors um, were facilitating um, change in this um, hospital in order um, to prevent falls. So this kind of trust base and uh, collaboration um, amongst teams. Right. Um, my final slide, I skipped that, yeah, is um, we are providing uh, like an analytical framework for the cases um, that are to follow. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the case studies that we will see now um, are a bit like a lot of and different animals in the zoo. Yeah. And maybe what we can then um, come back to in the, in the closing sessions is that we look at these cases from different angles. Yeah. So who is um, coordinating the actors within the organization, within the administration um, in these cases? How does the cooperation with um, external um, actors of the administration look, like um, administrations plus um, agencies? How about citizens' involvement? Were citizens involved in designing, co-creating um, the innovation? And then finally, how um, yeah, was the innovation communicated? So how was it presented? Um, how was it marketed? And yeah, we can see whether we find on these uh, yeah, different pillars some of the factors that make um, the following examples um, outstanding. So that's all from me. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tobias. Very, very interesting indeed. And also uh, contributing to some of the analysis that we at the OPSI are also doing for the upcoming report at the end of this year, where we're also looking at the influence of, uh, of uh, these uh, paradigms across different, uh, uh, different types of innovation. So has NPM, for example, killed off missions or has the new new governance uh, paradigms actually making room for anticipation on other types of innovation. So extremely interesting uh, piece of research as well. Uh, I'm going to welcome now back uh, uh, all of our speakers to ask a few questions and very interesting questions that are coming up from the, the chat itself. So uh, uh, Chiara, Patrick and Dovias, I wanted to actually start off with something that uh, is um, is one of the kind of the hardest questions that in the innovation world that we are facing as well, uh, connected to the fact that uh, always when we're talking about really new things, the burden of proof is extremely high. 
So if you're proposing a new service or, or something totally new, uh, then the burden of proof is extremely high indeed. But when we're actually uh, talking about existing services, then there aren't actually a lot of drivers to uh, really push for productivity increases uh, or things connected to that or innovations or looking over or reviewing your existing activities from an enhancement perspective. And we have a great question from the chat from Zippa uh, Forasti uh, connected to those, these kind of dilemmas, which asks when enhancing innovation and productivity, how do you encourage to leave something behind or even undoing some of these processes or analyzing these? Do you have some examples on how to decide uh, if something is important or not? Uh, maybe we can start off by Patrick from a kind of productivity perspective. Uh, how does that analysis actually go, or where have you seen successes or failures connected to that? Well, I, I'm a great believer in leaving things behind, particularly pre-digital ways of doing things. Uh, so, you know, um, when the uh, British Tax Agency transformed to doing uh, self-assessment online, they were able to move 15,000 people out of completely pointless jobs, rekeying paper tax returns into into more productive work and so i think that the, the, that kind of opportunity extends very very widely um you know what will what we need to really think about perhaps developing in order to overcome the change problem is things like a competition between a di digital solution and uh, a non-digital solution let me give you a for example uh, most countries maintain public library networks. These public library networks are a little bit depressing. The books are very out of date. Sometimes they're not used a lot. Uh, meanwhile, e-books are available, uh, but they're not being funded by the state. Well, maybe we should, for example, have a competition, see how many citizens want to use conventional public libraries, how many want to use e-book uh, systems. And then depending on how the popularity of different options goes, we could perhaps run down some public library functions and just uh, give a much more uh, effective way of transmitting information to citizens. So that's the kind of thing I think that, you know, you, you should think about a, a comparative uh, a competition almost between digital and non-digital solutions, and then see which way the the customers going of course that still means you have a digital divide problem you have to look after people who are locked into non-digital ways of, of doing things but we've seen for example in the covid uh, 19 uh, pandemic that um, the issue that you raised which is that many uh, changes in public sector administration are incubated for very long periods of time before they then get operationalized We've seen that happen in our in our health service here. So you know, video online uh, consultations were absolutely negligible last year. Uh, phone consultations were ten percent. Suddenly they become ninety percent um, uh, for both family doctors and for uh, a great many outpatients in our hospitals. But we can see other examples where we're lagging you know, 15 years behind society. For example, there's not one single country in the world where you can contact the emergency services using a video smartphone and show them exactly what's going on, what the condition of a patient is, how serious the fire is, and so forth. Yet we've had smartphones around for, you know, 10 or 15 years, and 90% of people have smartphones. So, you know, there are huge strategic opportunities to accelerate the pace of change and to make really substantial changes in the in the effectiveness as well as in the uh, productivity of, of public services. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, Chiara, I want to actually follow up on what Patrick was saying that uh, one of the drivers really in the public sector could be these kind of comparative experiments where you are kind of creating these competitions about the status quo versus a new type of uh, service intervention. Based on your experience of driving these kind of uh, experimental approaches connected to behavioral insights, what makes a government adopt such an approach or what are the kind of the barriers to actually approaching um, 
enhancement or an innovation or innovation in that way. And um, great, great question, Pirette. I think there are too many to uh, to be to be listed for sure. Uh, having an experimental mindset, an experimental approach, a systematic one is tricky because sometimes we discover things we don't like. And so if there is already an agenda set, um, then the, if the experiment uh, shows you otherwise, then it's annoying. And so one of this, this is one of the main uh, barriers. But going back as well to the questions um, asked by Sirpa, I just want to mention two quick things that I think are two main barriers uh, to, um, you know, in, to have um, better a better use of the innovative practices we have. The first one is what we call subtraction bias, which is just the fact that as humans we are we have the tendency to always think as the first solution um, to add something to the system. So there is a public uh, service that doesn't work well, let's add another element, let's add something else. And so it's normal, like we, we, we all have more staff compared to two years ago. Uh, we are more busy now compared to two years ago. So we, we have this tendency of adding things and we tend to underestimate the power of subtracting things. And so I think this is an important thing. I don't have the solution, but maybe trying to uh, think about what are the existing, what, how we can create incentives to scan opportunities to subtract, subtract things instead of adding things, that will be important. And the second thing I wanted to mention is a status quo bias. So coming back to your question, Spirit, this is something that is, is very strong. Once a service is up and running, a service, even an innovative service, once it's up and running, then um, challenging the status quo is very, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Then going back or subtracting things is difficult. And so I think in order to embed experiment, an experimental approach, it's important to um, have some sort of kind of maybe a maximum of two years of trailblazer things. And then you review. So not giving things for granted that once a service is up and running, it will stay the same for the next 30 years. Um, and then maybe we should just ask our citizens, right, uh, to signal if there's anything that it's not as useful, <laughs> so that we can st start to subtract, subtract things and undo some of the existing processes. So just some random, random ideas here, but thanks for the questions. Thank you so much, Chiara. Uh, definitely. Maybe a behavioral insights guide for the death of services uh, from the public sector, of, from OOPSI, that is, would be a very interesting uh, add as well to kind of substack services in the future. Um, but I want to also come to a question from Andrea Erde, a very interesting question. And I'm going to start off with uh, the bias, uh, Tobias, on this one that uh, the elements uh, of resilience and uh, versus efficiency are right at the kind of the cusp of debate at the moment. that. Uh, that are talked about everywhere. So are these kind of small steps of bottom-up innovation or incremental innovations going to be enough to transform the system? So how do we align this kind of enhancement approach with a more broader uh, resilience approach or more transformation of systems? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pirel, and thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Um, also, I don't have the, the panacea to that question, yeah? Um, but uh, if you invite people from, from a university um, to speak at the forum, then we will tell you something about um, education and, and, and teaching. So um, what I put in the link is um, a, a, a project by um, colleagues from the University of Konstanz and a, a, like a collaboration project that uh, wants to, to design a curriculum like for the education of um, public managers in a digital age. And of course, um, innovation is core um, to to that yeah so um maybe we, we we should also think about okay how do we need to educate um our our civil servants how can we instill this um mindset of um yeah um, always improving continuous improvement in um the the, the education system yeah uh yeah the question on, on resilience is obviously tricky and uh, kind of maybe let me finish with an anecdote so um Mao Zedong was once asked about the effects of the French Revolution like 
200 years ago. And he said, yeah, it's too early to tell. Yeah. So maybe that's kind of my way to muddling through this question. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tobias. Uh, thank you all for the speakers and the panel. I think we could continue on speaking quite some time and debating on these issues, but uh, please think kind of the insights also into your breakout rooms that we can discuss uh, on exactly these issues more thoroughly later on. But now we're actually going to put the spotlight on Austria. I'm going to hear uh, what is going on in Austria connected to enhancement-oriented innovation and how different approaches, very practical terms in specific cases can be applied to make uh, uh, different organizations more innovative, more productive and uh, more um, effective uh, in the long term. So the first case that we're going to look at is from the city of Vienna and we're going to look at something that in public administration terms have been talked a lot about in terms of the public management instruments and how actually quality management and common assessment frameworks can support innovation happening. These are usually two topics that are not looked together um, uh, usually. So we don't tend to talk about lean management and innovation or quality management innovation, but these are clearly linked and influence each other and also influence the type of innovations that organizations follow up with. So I'm going to give it over to Eva to uh, talk about the case, and right after after Eva's uh, finished uh, presenting, then we are going to uh, also give a couple of questions to Eva about the case itself. So please add your questions to the chat. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me and uh, already see my slides. I enlarged them. Just a second. Yeah. Welcome to the city of Vienna. I have the pleasure to take you on to a short journey into the city and behind the scenes. Um, I, acting as guidance, uh, have worked for the city for many, many years. So we could say I'm an eyewitness to the transformation and to the development of the city and public administration. Um, due to size of the city complexity, it will rather be a string of impressions to arouse your interest. And I'm happy to answer your questions after the presentation. But perhaps let me stick to the picture of journey, leading you through, zooming into the city, um, and also using the picture of uh, journey as a synonym perhaps for ongoing development of exploring, of uh, coming to new points. On the other hand, uh, plan your future and to most of the time being prepared for surprises. So let's start into our journey. Um, speaking of tourism, speaking of journeys means that most of our uh, tourists long for our past our cultural heritage. But it's just one aspect that makes us a bit special in the heart of Europe. We have the uh, opportunity to build bridges, to build bridges to our very neighbors, far neighbors to the world, but on the other hand, to our citizens. And that's what our tradition is. We have a closeness to our citizens and we believe that this might be a key factor for, let's call it our success as a city. Our proof of success of uh, governing the city might be that it is attractive to people. It is a good place to be in any case, an interesting one, but many consider it a perfect place for living. And we are growing, we are growing fast. We are one of the fastest growing cities in Europe will soon reach the margin of 2 million citizens, inhabitants. This might be because um, we have reached quite a high level on uh, different aspects, governance, quality of living, modernization, smart city index, and so on. 
uh, if you're interest, interested in these rankings, please do go in detail. We have a link inserted into the slide. But what it means is besides a reward to our efforts, it is also a feedback. And you know, speaking of quality, quality management, we long for feedback, we long for indicators, um, information, where we are, where we shall go into the future and what has worked and what has not worked perfectly so far. So let's then zoom into what it means to be in the city of Vienna, living in Vienna. We have a tradition of looking at our services and our citizens, the needs of our citizens in a holistic way. That means quality of living comprises housing. And you might know that we have a very long tradition of around 100 years of uh, municipal housing being one of the big tenants in the city, uh, thus uh, providing affordable housing. But it is also about social and health service, environmental aspects, science, economy, culture, and so on. Starting from this point, you might uh, call it in total a quality of governments for quality of living. And this has been our tradition. When I spoke of the past years, uh, I'd like to mention just one aspect. Being close to the city also means literally close. And we also have a tradition of around a hundred years of one-stop shops, as I just indicated before. Meaning we have facilities, we have district, government, we have municipal district offices, bringing public administration very close to citizens, like in smaller villages. And this might also be a key success factor that our citizens encounter public administration on one side as being close to them. On the other hand, perhaps when it comes to central services, not as close as they wanted it to be. But on our way through the journey of development transformation, we just had this in mind. From a classic administration, of course, providing services and maintaining order as local authority, we transformed into a role of facilitator. That might sound a bit um, highbrow, but in the inner sense of the meaning, it's just that. We look at the needs, we look at the opportunities, and we develop together with our citizens, the city, the future of the city. This, of course, meant a change of mindset. And uh, I want to describe it to you as an intertwined change of mindset on the level of the administration and also on the level of civil society. But I have to admit, the first, the first major step was done by the city administration. And we went along the path, as you already had heard, from the classic traditional um, administration, alongside new public management, into good governance, to our level of very close and partnership, a form of partnership administration. This mindset, of course, had to start, as I said, within the administration, but to uh, be exact, within the heads, the mindsets of all the actors in public administration. And from there, on to the recipients of our services to the citizens. And might be surprisingly, but in fact, it wasn't really. We met there because it was just what the citizens already wanted. They had good ideas. Of course, they are interested in how the city develops and what might be achieved in the future. So there was, we can describe it as a mutual starting point of a journey together. 
And on this journey, of course, we encountered all uh, different steps of transformation from classic tools to modern tools. And this partnership also allowed us um, the pace that was needed, the uh, different steps on one hand in public administration getting used for our staff also and to get used for our citizens because you can't do it in a hurry. You have to get acquainted to, you have to adjust to, and you have to be prepared for modernization and upcoming opportunities. And let me just briefly um, tell you that with all these uh, preparatory steps and work, we seemed quite fit when all of a sudden, not what we usually do, develop step by step, but when there came the big disruption by in form of the pandemic. And still due to our services, due to the trust and due, due to the new form of partnership, it was possible to provide our citizens and of course also our staff with orientation, timely information and guidance through the time of crisis. Based on well-known and often used uh, features like our virtual uh, government uh, websites in different languages, uh, we also use modern communication facilities like the Vienna bot. You might know it, is, uh, it is a machine man and back commun communication device where you can very easily buy a smartphone text or talk your um, inquiries to the machine and get an answer very fast and quite nicely more often uh, in the idiom and dialect of Vienna. So it brings it very close to the citizens and what the citizen might encounter as well-known, trustworthy um, communication. But of course, that's not all. We also um, make sure that what might be done by the uh, public administration, but might be needed in civil society is provided. Just to name one, a very short video clip for children to get to know what it is about going through a crisis, encountering challenges due to threats for the health. And of course, next to that, we have quite a lot of uh, features, uh, information uh, for our guests choice and so on but not to forget permanent updated information for our employees, our staff. But now let's uh, turn back from the crisis to general features, some keywords of change, of mutual development, city administration on one side, civil society on the other side, reaching the gap. It's about culture, organizational and societal culture. It's about open-minded, open and active communication, transparency, and utmost participation within the administration, with the citizens, with the customers. Sitting in one boat, being on one journey means exchange of expectations, exchange of what can we do, uh, trying out what might be feasible, spreading the word, going, the past the road together. And of course, on the side of administration, that means development, constant development. In Vienna, it means impact orientation, custom orientation, but also uh, agreement between the political level and administrative level. We use, have used for a long time, a systematic agreement system to obtain this agreement and thus um, provide constant, constantly uh, new services, new features like quality management, different 
models and tools of management. This brings me to the core of um, this presentation, a glimpse into quality management in the city of Vienna and one model we have um, come to cherish, to love uh, when it comes to, to my view, because I'm one of the ambassador, ambassadors of um, the tool Common Assessment Framework. What is it? It is a tool designed by public administration, by experts from the EU for public administration literally for enhancement oriented innovation in public administration. It's 20 years old and it's still new and up to date because it undergoes permanent change itself. I come to that in a minute. Um, to uh, make it clear, common assessment framework not only provides guidance onto modern public administra administration, but also guidance onto cultural change. And this is achieved by uh, some features you might of course already know, continuous improvement by the PDCA cycle. Learning organization is in the core of the many goals. It is also about self-assessment, thereby um, focusing on expertise from within but also, again, building bridges with partners, citizens, other public administration actors, and so on. And um, including, or rather being based on the principles of excellence and on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, thus providing also a link to an overall development in direction of public administration development in Europe worldwide, but easily linked to own strategies, to own goals, and very easy to handle. Therefore, any department, any organization, any topic, you name it, of your organization can use this tool. I hope I could arouse a little interest because due to time, I now have to zoom out again and come to our impact, proof of impact. Um, we are in a happy situation that we can say, um, when we look and when we assess ourselves, there is impact. There is impact in our gained expertise, in our self-development, because that's all about, you have to develop alongside the framework, your context, and alongside the ability of your citizen. And thereby the um, goal of becoming facilitator was achieved or is constantly being achieved. To illustrate this, just one very well-known feature, smart city. What is smart city Vienna about? It is about um, continuous development for everyone, for citizens regarding uh, environmental aspects, economic aspects, technical aspects, and so on. Also, of course, the SDGs and taking the citizens onto this road also. Just as a um, reminder, we do provide information. What is Smart City been about? What does it mean to me? How can I join? How can I support these efforts? And this brings me to almost the last slide to the, not the end, but to let's say uh, just an intermediate um, stop pause of uh, the journey um, to tell you that the citizens and the staff of the administration, I may say so, wouldn't want to change traditional administration for what it has become to transformed into a reliable and I have to emphasize capable partner for the future of the citizens being interested in the many aspects and looking for necessary steps in the interest of common good, in the, interest, in the interest of what is needed 
to provide not only good, excellent public administration, but guidance into the future. Thank you for your interest. I'm happy to answer your questions now, but I think you might have question, questions later on. I'm happy to offer my uh, contact data and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your interest and thank you for your patience because I think it has been quite a um, demanding journey in and out of the city administration. Thank you so much, Eva, for the insights. I think uh, we are, uh, all want to learn more how you apply the uh, common assessment framework in practice. But uh, uh, for now, uh, in terms of conserving time, I'm going to go to the tax office uh, of the Austrian government. And from Ernst, we're going to hear a little bit uh, about uh, the online tax system and also the chatbot integration and what kind of advancements it has made in the organization itself. Uh, Ernst, I'm going to give it over to you. And again, a reminder, that please add your questions. We will have a, a time for maybe one or two after the presentation before we go to a break. Uh, but add them there, uh, Ernst, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pirette. Uh, it's a pleasure to join this meeting and that we are allowed to, to present our finance online and our chatbot, who we are. My name is Ernst. I'm responsible for the customer relationship management in the Federal Ministry of Finance. And Andrea, please introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Andrea. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Andrea. I'm in the Austrian Ministry of Finance in the IT department, and I'm head of the team which is responsible for Finance Online, our online tax platform, which we will talk about today. Thank you. Well, we are constantly improving, of course, both of, of both products, Finance Online and, and Chatbot, of course. But especially at Finance Online, we can look back on a period of more than 20 years as you can see a few slides later. Uh, please go to the next slide, Andrea. Um, but before we, we start talking about Finance Online and Chatbot, I will give you some information about our organization. Uh, since the January this year, we have just five offices in Austria, and two of them are tax offices, one a tax office for large companies and tech, one tax office for other companies and in, individuals. And also the customer services are located at the second one. Uh, we have about 11,000 civil servants uh, in around 100 locations all over the uh, country. And most of them are working, of course, in the, in the tax offices. Next slide, please. So let me say some words about our strategic uh, customer service. As you know, a good customer service work, works like a clockwork. If one gears does not uh, run smoothly, there will be problems with the other ones. So it is very important to us that the gears mesh perfectly and work together. And Ansonlen is, of course, one of the most important gear in, in our clockwork. And we have just one uh, online portal for all tax, tax issues and also for all tax, all target groups like employees, families, companies, or tax advisors. And of course, we, we are providing different functionality to each target. On the one hand, we are very proud that Finance Online is the most used e-government portal in Austria. But on the other hand, it means also that the eyes are always on, on Finance Online and every change affects a large target group and must therefore be carefully considered. Uh, Andrea? Okay, thank you, Ernst. Um, just to let you know what we're talking about, we have around 9 million inhabitants in Austria and roughly 4.7 million are using finance online of the individuals and 0.6 million companies. So we have around 5.4 million users. That's what Ernst already said, when we are doing changes or when we have any defects, then a large audience will, will register it. We have around 70 million logins per year 
that's quite a lot, as you can see. And when you're asking yourself, what is finance online about and what can you do there? I will give you a short overview. Um, it is a text platform for three user groups, for individuals, for companies, and for tax advisors and accountants, all in the same user interface, basically. And you can do uh, electronic text assessments. We, you have a dashboard where you can see your latest assessments and the status of it. You have the chatbot integrated. Uh, Ernst will talk about it later. You can do instant text calculations and so on. And we started um, with Finance Online in 1998 with a very limited set of functionality only for uh, tax advisors and accountants. And we did a stepwise um, implementation of further functionality in 2003. We opened Finance Online for every taxpayer in Austria. And then in 2005 and 2018, we did more or less um, a user interface uh, face, facelift, but not a big change. It was just a new user interface. Um, and but in 2020, we did a bigger relaunch and we tried to change our approach of implementing um, functionality in finance online. As it was mentioned before, we tend always to add new functionalities and in our last big project in 2020, we tried to do it in another way and we will talk about it now. Uh, what we have planned, what we have planned for the future is to do also the relaunch we did for individuals. Uh, we also wanted to do for companies because now we were only focusing on private individuals who are not tax experts. And we do, of course, small um, changes every year all the time because the tax law changes every year and we do small changes always. What were, were our principles for our big relaunch in 2020? We put the user in the middle. Well, in the past, we tended to, to, to have a very legal approach on changes. We followed the law step by step, but it was very complicated and very complex and not easy to understand for individuals who were no tax experts. Now we tried to change it a little bit. We put the user in the middle, we created a persona, I will talk about it later, and we, we asked ourselves, what is this person who is using finance online? What, is, what are the challenges? Then another um, very important point for us was mobility. We know that young people are mainly using um, online services with smartphones and not with laptop or desktop versions. So we created a responsive application and an application for mobile devices. We also um, have the possibility of multimedia content. We have videos, chats, and so on. And it's interactive. We can send push emails on certain happenings. You can register for this push notification and you get a, a message in, in certain cases. We have a hotline and the chat integrated. And um, what is most important, Finance Online is integrated into our tax IT landscape, which is a big number of systems in the back. Finance Online is more or less the interface for input and output of information, but all the calculation and check is done in the backend. In the back uh, we had one big target. Um, when we did the relaunch, um, we, we said that the employee tax assessment should be made in an easy way, in a new innovative surface. Because, you know, every one of us is using Google, Amazon, Facebook, and so on. And we are kind of used to the way it behaves. So we tried um, to adopt a little bit to this, to this user experience. And in the back, of course, we had five goals we wanted to meet. We wanted to reduce the physical context in our, in our tax offices. We wanted to increase the online quota of the usage of finance online. We wanted to reduce errors that the user can make when doing his tax assessment, because this leads to the next goal. We wanted to, to make the process faster for the users and for our employees. And of course, we wanted to increase the popularity of finance online. 
Uh, as I already mentioned um, a little bit how we did it, uh, we started, I think, two years before our project in, 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 nine, in 2019, we did the implementation, but two years before, we started with an idea competition via our crowdsourcing platform E3 Lab. E3 uh, stands for Easy, Efficient and Electronic. We collected a lot of ideas and comments. Uh, then we did several workshops with users, experts, uh, and our organization to, to evaluate these ideas and prioritize. And we developed a customer journey. Uh, as I mentioned, we created an average finance online user or an average Austrian taxpayer. We called him Manfred. He was 45 years old. He was married and had two children, and he was used to to smart smartphone and, and digital uh, devices. And we thought in his uh, name, um, from the day he wants to do his tax assessment to the day he receives the money on his bank account, what, what, is, he, what is he facing? What challenges is he facing? What are the ups and downs in, in his process? And we involved users during the whole development, we, we had um, pilots, which we showed to users and prototypes, and we always were collecting feedback and trying to react on it. And Ernst will now give you a quick overview um, about what was our solution. Okay, thank you. So there are some screenshots of Finance Online and I make it short. Uh, one of the new parts is, is the overview page after logging. In the past, we had a lot of nested menu items. Customers had to look for the information and they wanted uh, and the, the function they needed. And the aim of this page is that customers no longer have to search for the information or functions, but have them clearly presented on one page. The, Next, uh, the second big change. Next slide, please. Uh, Andrea? Yes. yes. The, the, second big, yes, yes. the second big change is the assistant for the tax return of individuals, which you can see on this and on the next slide. Uh, customers are asked simple yes, no questions. And so they compile their individual tax return. Only those input files are uh, displayed the, that also apply to the respective life situation. So for many customers, this means that they have to pay attention to fewer than, than 10 input fields. And of course, there are also uh, many smaller changes such as a new mailbox or push notifications when the status of the tax return changes and so on. This, this was a, a short overview about uh, the screenshots of Finance Online. Now I want to come to our chatbot Fred. He is a more or less new baby. Next slide, please. Uh, and Fred should help us to avoid, avoid uh, phone calls and face-to-face -face contacts from which we have a lot in Austria. I think it's the same situation in many countries and many organizations. And so we started in September 2019 with a soft launch and one topic. And we were very surprised by the positive uh, feedback and the high usage figures. And now we have nine topics and a lot of calls and that without uh, advertising. And uh, we also offer a, a live chat. And in less than 5% of the cases, a human contact is asked by the, cu by the customers. Uh, so uh, not, not, many, in, not in many cases, uh, we have a live chat. Next slide, please. Uh, Fred became one of the most important chatbots for public administration in Austria in a very short time. This is mainly thanks to an editorial team that teaches Fred new topics and assures that the answers get better and better. Uh, we have about 25 civil servants, uh, which spend a few hours a week for training the bot. In the future, of course, Fred should uh, provide uh, more functions, but this proposed authentication if, uh, in Fred is made possible via Finance Online so that the bot can also provide personal information if you ask for that. 
And in addition, it will be possible to fill out simple forms and we can, we plan uh, cooperations with several public administration bots so that all of these bots become smarter overall. So this was a very short overview about finance online and the integration of a chatbot thread. And now we are looking forward to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both uh, Andrea Ernst and uh, also uh, Eva. Uh, we're trying to get back on track a little bit. So what I'm proposing is that uh, you uh, pose the questions to the speakers in the chat and we'll try to facilitate through that. Uh, and uh, we go ahead with the agenda because we have still uh, quite a lot to do. So please post your questions in the chat format and hopefully we can facilitate the answers through there. So I hope everybody found their way back to the main room and you had wonderful discussions in your breakout rooms. But now I would also like to kind of harvest and a little bit learn about the different types of uh, insights that you gathered across these groups. And I'm going to maybe start off with uh, Angela, who was um, in the general service design section to give us an overview about what the group discussed and what the kind of the general takeaways were. Yeah, thank you, Pirat. Um, so we, so during our discussion about uh, challenges, um, of course, we had uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that come up with innovation in general. Um, such as, you know, mindset uh, issues and, you know, issues of we've always uh, done it this way, uh, these kind of narratives uh, that tend to hold back uh, even the, the hungry people that might be uh, within a, an organization. So we, we talked a bit about uh, that. Um, and as a, um, as a way to kind of combat that, uh, we had a little bit of a discussion about um, how to find and work with the willing uh, within an organization. Uh, so there were a couple of examples of that and how that's been successful. Uh, but we talked to quite a lot about uh, uh, these mindset issues and some operational issues uh, that tend to hold back uh, this work. Uh, and then we uh, moved on to talking about uh, tools. Um, there were a lot of uh, frameworks that were quite helpful, um, such as the common uh, assessment framework that was mentioned, uh, but also some, some others that were brought up. Uh, and then uh, we talked about kind of the, the pra uh, practice of uh, changing and redesigning services and the influence of uh, service design. Uh, so recent trends in uh, incorporating that more into practices, uh, including things like stakeholder mapping, um, doing more hackathons, uh, these kind of methods to get closer to the users themselves. Uh, there are some that we didn't get a chance to discuss that had to do with different working methods and, and transversal working groups and partnerships. Um, that was uh, an interesting topic. We didn't get to dive into much, but there are a few uh, really interesting examples that were brought up around uh, gamification and using things uh, like uh, uh, more playful uh, methods to actually get insights uh, from users directly, such as uh, youth as well, um, and trying to target those uh, users that might be uh, furthest away uh, or more difficult to reach. Uh, so some specific uh, tools were discussed uh, in, in our group. Uh, I won't go into much of the, the detail because I know we have a lot of share outs to do, um, but really interesting examples from, um, from my group and, and thanks for everyone uh, for those. Thank you so much, Angela. We'll go over to Chiara and the uh, insights around behavioral insights. Thanks so much. Um, so we had great discussions in our uh, group. Um, so we identified several themes for the challenges. Um, scaling and having a long-term impact as being one of the most discussed. Um, the second one being knowledge and understanding of behavioral insights and its principles, at least for BI. So many, many people, especially you know, senior executives don't really know how to make the best use of BI. Uh, so that's a barrier and a challenge. 
uh, also adapting to the context and to the feedback and trying to be flexible about the innovation itself. Um, it's a challenge. And another thing is lack of resources um, tools and instruments to use and a lack of BI knowledge within government. We had some um, examples of BI used outside government uh, from consulting firms. There's a lack of BI knowledge in, in government. And, and also very important, alignment with stakeholders. So once sometimes it's something that we, um, it's an initiative that is not very well aligned to the final end users and the stakeholders and the final decision makers. So it's definitely something it, uh, to be um, mindful of. And in terms of tools and methods, um, we, we cited some examples of new uh, things that have been used, definitely quite skewed towards a randomized control trials, but also design thinking. And just wanted to mention one thing that Scott shared with us um, with the rest of the group, that it would be great to and start to share more of what didn't work. And so he shared with us that more or less 60% of the interventions they run at Beta um, do work, while 40% actually don't work. And so being transparent on this is definitely one of the main challenges, but it will be really useful for, um, for people outside that team. And so that's all from us, thank you. Thank you so much, Chiara. Uh, over to Sam and uh, how to use technology for the benefit of the enhancement. Thank you, Prep. Um, so following uh, Chaga Hashiguchi, my OECD colleague, his presentation on um, telemedicine, um, it was clear that the technology itself wasn't necessarily the biggest challenge. And actually, it was about more creating a sort of supportive policy environment and the right governance structures. Um, so there were various elements of the supportive and policy environment that people found that were, were a particular challenge. Um, but then also when we come to transparency and data, there were questions about how the data was being governed, um, who exactly were, were governments dependent on for their technology and who was managing the data, how you manage databases. Um, but then other broader issues included inclusion and sustainability. So inclusion, the digital divide we know is a, is a particular issue as we digitize services, are we actually exacerbating um, current divides and making things worse? Uh, and how do we therefore design things correctly to, uh, to overcome this, these problems? Um, one of the interesting points I thought was the uh, legacy and zombie technologies and sustainability. So not just the question of who manages these uh, big projects often in the long run, but also how do we transition away from technologies as they become potentially obsolete and how do we stay relevant and transitioning forwards into the future. Uh, then some of the tools and methods that were being used. Um, we had some very interesting things, uh, for example, on participatory. So how do we ensure that the services we're designing are actually the right services for the needs of citizens? Um, so we had empathy labs, for example, uh, making sure we're designing around user experience uh, moving towards sort of the use of digital technology. So can we create participatory logics and co-creation dynamics in the actual design of our, of our services? And I think this sort of service design is something that echoed, it seems, across, across all three of the discussions and, and is certainly something that resonated with, uh, with the participants here. So back to you, Perrette. Thank you so much, Sam. Very good insights indeed. We are running uh, towards the close of the workshop and I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about what we're going to do with those insights. But first of all, I'm going to give the floor over to Michael and Tobias uh, in terms of the kind of the perspectives on the Austrian side to close the workshop. Yes, uh, thank you, Pirat, for giving us the last word. And I hand over to Tobias uh, for two minutes about his view uh, his academic view about the presentations we heard in this very interesting workshop today. Tobias, please. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, I think one of the, the, the things from an academic perspective is what um, was discussed, that um, it's, it's quite natural that we all, when we are invited to such workshops, um, are focusing on the things where uh, that were considered a success. Yeah. However, and uh, 
and, and I mean, there is this uh, repository on the um, on, on, on the website and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, yeah, and, and this was very interesting to see that everyone, when you dig a bit deeper into these topics, um, saw, said, OK, well, there are also some things that didn't work. And maybe maybe building on on that. Yeah. This is also a bit to do with um, teaching so the the educating the the, the the managers for for tomorrow or the people who are work in um, in innovation yeah so kind of how can we pass on that that knowledge um, on what works and also for um, for future generations or yeah for for the next leaders to avoid some mistakes that had been um, made uh, in the past, yeah. So, so maybe that's very briefly what what's my take home uh, from uh, from this workshop. Yeah. So, so a lot of bright lights, yeah. But um, there are also some shadows. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tobias. So I can only conclude from my side that I enjoyed the workshop very much. Um, we made also good context, maybe uh, to establish in the, deeper in the future and to exchange more about our experiences, good and bad. And then it uh, just best to say uh, thanks to OECD, uh, to the best workshop architects in the world and the best workshop facilitators in the world. So we can then clap. And uh, maybe next year, uh, maybe we can meet in Vienna for a real life uh, OPSI and not only meet in Vienna, but also uh, include the possibilities we now have with the online uh, collaboration and do it in a, in a hybrid way. So I enjoyed it very much. Uh, thanks to all of you for your participation and input. And again, for the last time, I hand over to Pierrette. Thank you so much, Michael and Tobias. Uh, first of all, a great thank you to uh, Austria and especially Michael from all the effort to actually putting together this workshop and and helping us really to put a spotlight on, on the enhancement-oriented innovation. Uh, I think uh, you know as well that uh, by far this is going to be one of the most, uh, where we spend actually the most time, or where innovators actually spend most time on innovation. So uh, in the broader portfolio of things, while anticipation or the future of work or automatization or artificial intelligence may grab the attention, that actually this is the type of work that we're doing. And the great insights from the, from the speakers themselves uh, are that uh, enhancement directed innovation doesn't have to be incremental or small uh, to actually work. So they can actually think about also enhancing uh, broader systems uh, at the systems while to get the kind of the inc increases in productivity and effectiveness that the public sector actually needs to have. So it's the level of ambition that uh, needs to be connected to the work itself. But what is going to happen with the insights uh, from these workshops? So we are going to write up, of course, the report of the workshop and all the great insights and the cases that were shared uh, with you during the last three hours. Uh, we are doing our own uh, research on the ongoing uh, work on the H2020 with the European Commission on Innovation Facets and later this autumn, we will also publish a report connected to that. In, we are going to have a virtual um, work, a huge conference together with Slovenia uh, in October. And prior to that, we will also try to lease uh, kind of more consumable policy briefs connected to the, to the enhancement-oriented innovation and different types of innovation. Uh, but last but not least, but also we want to have a policy brief and approach within the wider report, uh, but also in a policy brief format in terms of the portfolio approaches. So how does uh, enhancement-oriented innovation actually interact with different types of other types of innovation as well? How do we uh, kind of manage these different types of innovations within our broader portfolios uh, as well? And what in the public sector actually drives or sets barriers to different types of innovation. So these are all of the things that we want to really push forward with that report and the policy briefs that are upcoming later this year. And last but not least, I want to say thank you to everybody who participated. And three hours in a virtual format is a very long time. 
So I commend you from all the energy and thank you all to the speakers and also the facilitators that uh, guide us, guided us through the, the workshop in its entirety. Uh, if you have any possible questions for speakers or cases or for us at the OECD, uh, please do get in contact with us and send us your questions. Uh, we're also going to put online the kind of the general panels and uh, cases from this workshop on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will not share any content from the breakout rooms, so the discussions there are going to be on Chatham House rule principles. Thank you again from OECD side and hope to see you soon, already beginning of June at the Adaptive Innovation Workshops together with Portugal. Thank you so much.